So today what we are discussing is normal MRI anatomy of the shoulder. In today's session, we'll be discussing about the normal anatomy and the MRI anatomy of shoulder joint, the sequences and planning for any MRI shoulder, how do I read a MRI shoulder scan and the checklist in different planes. For any shoulder joint, these are the normal structures that you need to look at. It's, a, it's just a list of structures. We'll be looking at each one of them in this entire session over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Whenever you do an MRI shoulder, there are two joints that you're going to cover. One is your glenohumeral joint and the other one is your acromioclavicular joint. Now, first we'll concentrate on the glenohumeral joint because that is a more important joint. So it's a ball and socket joint where the ball is nothing but the humeral head and the socket is nothing but the glenoid of the scapula. Now, if you note, the humeral head or the ball of the joint is larger, whereas the socket, which is the glenoid, is a more flattened appearance. And because the glenoid is more flat and the humerus is more larger, it provides more mobility to the shoulder joint. But this comes at an expense of instability. So, in order to provide more stability to the joint, there are soft tissue structures around the joint which help in making the joint stable. So, if you will see, this is your glenoid articular surface. Around the glenoid, you have a labrum, okay, this thin uh, purplish structure, which is the labrum. Then the green structure around it is the capsule, and around that, you have the rotator cuff tendons. So, these are the soft tissue structures around the shoulder joint that help to provide stability to the joint. And we need to look at all of these structures in a shoulder scan before labeling it as a normal scan. So, whenever you do an MRI shoulder, the sequences that you need to take is a T2 fat saturated coronal sequence. So, this is not a particular thing that everyone needs to do, but this is what we usually do in a routine practice. You can add and subtract sequences depending upon your personal uh, liking and experience. So, first we go for a T2 fat saturated coronal sequence. Now, the important thing is the planning of the coronal sequence. So, just remember whenever you take a coronal, plan it on an axial. The planning should not be along the muscle, but instead it should be along the tendon. So you can see this jet black structure that is a supraspinatus tendon in the axial plane. You need to plan your coronal along the supraspinatus tendon and not along the muscle. So make sure you inform this to your technician. Next sequences that we take is the proton density images in all the three planes. Proton density images, non-fat saturated sequences. Non-fat saturated because they give us a better visualization of the tendons, the small ligaments, labrum, cartilage, everything. And lastly, T1 weighted images are not taken in all the scans, but conditions where you're suspecting tumors, infections and inflammatory conditions, you need to go for a T1 weighted sequence. Now, how to approach an MRI shoulder scan? So, always have an approach for any joint that you report. For an MRI shoulder scan, I use the structural approach. That is, I go structure-wise and in that also, I use the inside-out approach. So, first, I look at the innermost structures and then I'll gradually make my way outwards. So, first, I look at the intra-articular structures that is bone, labrum, cartilage and capsule followed by biceps and rotator interval. Then, going further out, you have the rotator cuff muscles and tendons and the bursae. And last, I look at the AC joint and the neurovascular bundles. Now, all of us are aware of the anatomy of the bones. We've been reading them since our first year of MPBS. So, I'm not going much into it. What I'm going to discuss are the practical points which are important when you look at the scan. So, these are the areas that you need to keep an eye on when we are looking at an MRI shoulder scan. So, for humerus, look for the hill sacs and reverse hill sacs lesions, greater tuberosity fractures. Glenoid, look for the bony bankart and the antero inferior glenoid bone loss coracoid process fractures, acromion process fractures and this one important thing is distal end of clavicle. Important because we usually tend to miss this in the scan because it comes in the periphery of the scan. So make sure to look at the distal end of clavicle because there can be stress fractures and stress edema particularly in weight lifters in the distal end of clavicle. So now let's look at each of these on a normal MRI scan. So this is a coronal proton density non-fat saturated image. We are going from anterior to posterior. The anterior most structure that you see is this coracoid process along with the short head of biceps tendon. Now, as you go posteriorly, just make sure currently we are only looking at the bones and nothing else. So, as you go posteriorly, you begin to see the anterior inferior glenoid. Keep an eye over here for the bankart lesion, for the osseous bankart lesion and marrow edema. Then further posteriorly, look at the greater tuberosity where the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons attach. Avulsion fractures are common in this region and please note avulsion, usually these avulsion fractures are not displaced. So they are difficult to pick up on x-ray but they can be easily picked up on an MR. 
Then this is the important thing that I was talking about. Look at the distal end of clavicle because we usually tend to miss this area. Now, if we see in this region, this gray zone. So the black is the cortex. Above that, there is a gray zone. So this is nothing but your humeral articular cartilage. This is the glenoid, and over here also you can see there is a thin gray zone that is your glenoid articular cartilage. So this area is your subchondral region for the humerus and the glenoid. Keep an eye on this area for subchondral marrow edema and subchondral cystic changes, which will happen in venohumeral osteoarthrosis. Then, as you go further posteriorly in the posterior superior aspect of humeral head, look out for the for any flattening. Any marrow edema or any defect, which would indicate a hill sac lesion in a patient with recurrent dislocations. Okay, now let's look at the sagittal image. So we are going from lateral to medial, and again, this is a proton density non-fat saturated image. So you can see these are the tendons. It's a supraspinatus and intraspinatus tendons, and this is nothing but your greater tuberosity. So keep an eye over here for GT fractures as you go inwards or medially. Look at this region. So, if you see, this is your acromion process. So, this is posterior and this is anterior. So, posterior superior humeral head. Look out for any defects, any flattening and marrow edema suggestive of Hill-Sachs lesion. This is the most important sagittal image that you can get for a patient with anterior instability. So, this is nothing but the end face view of the glenoid or the glenoid articular surface. The black thing around it that you can see is the labrum. So this particular image is very important even for an orthopod. You need to look out for a anterior inferior glenoid bone loss or any osseous Bankart lesion. You can use your best fit circle method in this region where you draw a circle along the posterior and inferior cortex of glenoid, and it should pass through the anterior inferior cortex. If it does not pass, then it indicates that there is a anterior inferior glenoid bone loss. So just remember to get this section. This is really important section. The next thing is your coracoid process. Coracoid process fractures is particularly important in patients with anterior instability because whenever there is an anterior inferior glenoid bone loss which is significant, the orthopod will use this coracoid process and put it here, which is called as a lethargic procedure. For that, he needs an intact coracoid process. So just make sure that there are no fractures in the coracoid process. Now let us look at the axial scan. So you have a distal end of clavicle, which is the superior most image. Then what you see is your acromioclavicular joint. So this is your acromion process, distal end of clavicle, and this is the joint space. Inferiorly, when you go here, you can see this is the superior sections of the humeral head, and this is the posterior aspect. So you can see there is a curvature. It's actually a pretty round structure. Look for any flattening. Look for a wedge-shaped defect in this region and marrow edema, which will indicate a Hill-Sachs lesion. Further, inferiorly, look for the Hill-Sachs lesion. So just remember, when you go further inferiorly, there is a normal flattening in the posterior superior in, in the posterior humeral head. So this should not be labeled as a Hill-Sachs lesion. Hill-Sachs lesion is only when it is in the superior sections. But when you go inferiorly, this flattening is normal. Similarly, here we should look out for any again any marrow edema and a defect, which would indicate a reverse Hill-Sachs lesion. Again, inferiorly, you see there is a flattening in this region. This flattening is normal and should not be labeled as a Hill-Sachs lesion. As you go further inferiorly, look at the anterior inferior glenoid for any osseous Bankart lesion, for any glenoid bone loss and marrow edema. So these are the structures which are particularly important when you look at the bones. Now let's go to the labrum. So as I have told you, the glenoid socket is a flattened one. And in order to provide some concavity to it, there is a labrum around it. So this purple structure is your labrum, and this blue is nothing but the glenoid articular surface. Now, whenever you describe a labral tear, you need to describe the exact extent of the tear. For this, you can use something called as the clock position. So the superior one is your twelve o'clock position. The inferior is six o'clock position. The place where the biceps goes, here you can see the biceps is going this way. That's your anterior. Here you can also make out that this is your acromion process, so this is a posterior aspect. So anterior equator, equator is nothing but the midway. So anterior equator is three o'clock position, and posterior is nine o'clock position. Now there is some confusion sometimes in the nomenclature regarding the three and nine o'clock position. So in order to be completely crystal clear, what you need to do is you can also write about the quadrant in which the labral tear is present. So you can divide your labrum into like an X. So this is your superior quadrant, inferior quadrant, anterior and posterior quadrant. 
and one more line which you can add is a horizontal line joining the equator the anterior equator and the posterior equator so now the anterior labrum is further divided into anterior superior and anterior inferior labrum and the posterior labrum is further divided into posterior superior and posterior inferior labrum so whenever you describe a labral tear make sure to to tell which quadrant it is involving and also if you want you can give the clock of the tear so you can use both of this together but please make sure to use the quadrant because it's more crystal clear now whenever you look at the labrum the superior labrum is best seen on a mid coronal image so this and just remember all the la the labrum has a triangular appearance in whatever plane you look at it usually it's a triangular appearance so this is your superior labrum this smaller one is your inferior labrum and the anterior and posterior labrum are best seen on the axial images so this is your anterior labrum and this is your posterior labrum okay so now another structure which reinforces or provides stability to the joint is the capsule around the joint and important to note is anteriorly this capsule is thickened at places to form the glenohumeral ligaments so you have the superior glenohumeral ligament middle glenohumeral ligament and inferior glenohumeral ligament so these are present anteriorly inferior glenohumeral ligament also has a posterior band which is present posterior so now let us look at the labrum and the glenohumeral ligaments together on a axial scan so this is a axial pd non fat saturated image and this this is the topmost section so what you see is your superior labrum over here and you can see a thin flimsy structure that is coming out of the superior glenoid this is nothing but your superior glenohumeral ligament this ligament is better seen on a sagittal image and we'll have a look at it later further when you go inferiorly the structure that you see here you can see two structures so the triangular structure this one is your labrum okay this triangular structure is your labrum so this is the anterior labrum this is the posterior labrum another black structure that you see over here this is a thickening of the capsule which is nothing but the medial glenohumeral ligament now one more thing that i want you guys to note is this you can see there is a cleft so there is one sec i'll just go a step back yeah so you can see there is no cleft over here but there is a discrete cleft over here this should not be labeled as a tear this is a common normal variant called as sublateral foramen it is present in the antero superior quadrant unless you see a tear extending antero inferiorly or across the superior labrum into posterior superior quadrant do not label this as a tear this is just a sublateral foramen and another normal variant is where this mghl will be more thickened and you won't see a triangular labrum over here so you will see the posterior triangle but not the anterior superior triangle and that is nothing but a buford complex anatomy so here now as you go inferiorly this thing is your anterior inferior labrum this is your posterior inferior labrum and another thickening which you see uh, more lateral to the anterior anterior inferior labrum this is nothing but your inferior glenohumeral ligament and here you can see that the capsule is thin so the capsule is thin but this is more thickened capsule which is nothing but the glenohumeral ligament now this is just to show you the difference between a normal labrum and an abnormal labrum so this is a normal labrum normally there should not be a fluid signal intensity between the labrum and the glenoid bone and the glenoid cartilage so this is normal here you can see there is a discrete fluid signal intensity which is passing between the labrum and the underlying glenoid cartilage so this is nothing but a labral tear now as i told you sghl or the superior glenohumeral ligament is better seen on a sagittal image it's a thin flimsy structure which will arise from the glenoid we will further discuss this ligament when we discuss the rotator interval so for now you can just keep in mind that this is how sghl looks like and even your mghl and ighl can be seen on a sagittal image particularly in a patient who has joint effusion so whenever there is some joint effusion you can appreciate you can see on this diagrammatic image so this thing is the capsule you can see there is thickening so this is sghl mghl and ighl anterior band and you can correlate this image over here so you can see this is your thin capsule in this region it is thickened jet black structure that is your mghl and below it is another thickened jet black structure which is your ighl so this is how you can look at these ligaments even in a patient with joint effusion now what we need to look at is biceps and rotator interval now there are biceps can be divided into three parts so you have a horizontal segment which runs uh, about the humeral head then you have the pulley where it turns to form the vertical portion and the vertical portion runs in the bicipital groove biceps pulley is important because it stabilizes the biceps tendon in the region of the turning of the pulley 
and in the bicipital group. So it prevents biceps dislocation and biceps fully comprises of CHL that is coracohumeral ligament, superior glenohumeral ligament and superior subscapularis tendon. Rotator interval is present between three structures which we will discuss when we see the scan. So this is your biceps tendon. Okay. This is your short head of biceps and this is your long head of biceps. This is the horizontal portion of the biceps which arises from the supraglenoid tubercle. Then it will turn over here. So this is the region of the pulley and then this is the vertical portion which is running in the bicipital groove. So this is your uh, lesser tuberosity, this is your greater tuberosity and this is the bicipital groove. And across this uh, bicipital groove, you have something called as a transverse humeral ligament which is at nothing but a slip from the subscapularis tendon which stabilizes the tendon within the bicipital groove. Now important thing to understand is the biceps pulley. So you have the coracoid process. From the coracoid process, there is a ligament which comes out which is called as coracohumeral ligament. So it comes from the coracoid process and goes and attaches to the humerus near to the bicipital groove. So this is the superficial structure. When you remove the coracohumeral ligament, deep to it, you will find the biceps tendon traversing. So the red colored structure is the biceps tendon and you will find the superior genohumeral ligament which is a green colored structure. So medially, it is just alongside the biceps tendon but as it goes laterally it goes deep to the or it goes inferior to the biceps tendon. So now we look at the actual MRI images. We are going from again anterior to posterior on a coronal image. So first thing that you are seeing over here is the subscapularis tendon. Now as you go posteriorly you can, you can see your biceps tendon over here. This is the biceps tendon in the bicipital groove and this is the pulley region. Further on this is your horizontal portion of the biceps tendon. Above it is the supraspinatus tendon, below it is the biceps tendon. Here you can see the biceps tendon and this it goes and attaches to the labrum, the superior labrum. So this is nothing but your biceps labral junction. This is important in case of tears, slab tears can involve this biceps labral junction. So you should look at this properly. Next thing that we are going to discuss about is the rotator interval. So this is a sagittal image which is passing through the level of the glenohumeral joint line. And rotator interval is nothing but a triangular space which is present in the anterior superior aspect of the shoulder between coracoid process, subscapularis muscle and the supraspinatus muscle. So this triangular structure is the rotator interval. The main content of the rotator interval is fat. Now this is important and therefore your proton density images, non-fat saturated images have a role because fat will appear bright. Whenever there is adhesive capsulitis, there will be scarring with some amount of edema in the rotator interval. And that scarring is easily picked up on a proton density non-fat saturated image, whereas it is difficult to pick up on a fat saturated image. So unless there is going to be an edema, you are going to miss this finding completely on a fat saturated image. Hence, proton density non-fat saturated images are really important for shoulder imaging. So this is the fat region. If you see scarring in this region, you can think in terms of adhesive capsulitis. Now the next structure that is arising, this is your coracohumeral ligament. So as I told you, it, it arises from the coracoid process, goes to the humerus and attaches near the bicipital groove. So this is your triangular rotator interval. The coracohumeral ligament reinforces the roof of the rotator interval. And the contents of the rotator interval is this thin structure which we have seen before also, which is the superior glenohumeral ligament and biceps tendon in this region. So SGHL and biceps tendon are the contents of the rotator interval. Now as you go laterally, here you can see that the relation is biceps tendon and SGHL are next to each other with CHL forming the roof. Now as you go further laterally, you can appreciate this oval structure is your biceps tendon. Here you can see this is your SGHL, this is your SGHL and here you can see it is trying to go beneath. So there is a curve, it is trying to go beneath the biceps tendon. So here you have CHL on the top the biceps tendon and SGHL which is trying to go beneath and now in the region of the turning of the biceps tendon, you have the CHL on the top, you have the uh, biceps tendon and the SGHL is going beneath it. Now this biceps pulley region is particularly important whenever there is tear of the subscapularis or tear of the SGHL, it will result into dislocation. There are different types of dislocation of biceps tendon, so it's a different classification which you can look at it later. Now let us look at the most important thing that is the rotator cuff tendons. 
So uh, we all know that there are four rotator cuff muscles and tendons. So the superior is the supraspinatus. Anteriorly, you have the subscapularis. The third one is the infraspinatus, which is exactly posteriorly. So since this is a 2D image, I'm not able to show it here. So posteriorly, you have the infraspinatus. And posterior inferiorly, this is the teres minor tendon. Now, this is a sagittal image to show you the muscles. So, you can see this is the choropoid process. So, this is anterior. So, supraspinatus fossa has the supraspinatus muscle. Anteriorly is the subscapularis muscle. Posterior superiorly, you have the infraspinatus muscle. And posterior inferiorly, there is the teres minor muscle. Now, let us look at the tendons individually. So, this is a sagittal image at the level of the humeral head where you can appreciate all the tendons. So, this is a uh, point to note that a sagittal image, you can evaluate all the tendons together. So, the anterior tendon is your subscapularis tendon. If you see, there are multiple small jet black structures inside. So, it's a multi-pinnate tendon, not a single tendon. It's a multi-pinnate tendon. But on a diagrammatic image, I've actually drawn it as two, two separate structures. So, this is because the superior subscapularis and inferior subscapularis are functionally separated. So, superior subscapularis is a functionally different one and inferior is a functionally different one. But anatomically, they look single. And your superior subscapularis is particularly important because that is more prone to tears. The next what you have seen over here, this is your biceps tendon. And then you have the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendon. So, the first one is the supraspinatus tendon. The green structure is your infraspinatus tendon. And then there is a place where these two tendons merge with each other and that is nothing but your conjoint tendon. Uh, infraspinatus footprint is slightly larger as compared to your supraspinatus footprint. And inferiorly, posterior inferiorly is your teres minor tendon. Now, whenever you look at the rotator cuff, when you're evaluating rotator cuff, the supraspinatus tendon is best seen on a coronal image. Your subscapularis and infraspinatus tendons are best seen on axial images. Subtitle images, you can evaluate all the tendons together. So, normally, any tendon comprises of a footprint where it goes and attaches to the bone and there is a myotendinous junction where, it, uh, where there is a uh, junction between the tendon and the muscle and this is your tendon. So, but in case of a supraspinatus tendon, there is another zone which is important which is called as the critical zone. Now, this critical zone is approximately 1 cm away from the footprint. And this is important because in supraspinatus tendon, this region is slightly hypovascular. And because of the low vascularity, it's more common to have degeneration and degenerative tears in the critical zone of the supraspinatus tendon. Traumatic tears usually happen at the myotendinous junction. Besides, whenever you get the GP avulsion, then that will be a direct avulsion from the bone. Now, the next thing is the bursa. So, you have a subacromial bursa which lies deep to the acromion process above the supraspinatus tendon and it can also extend this way downwards deep to the deltoid muscle. So, it is also known as subacromial subdeltoid bursa. And the next two things that you need to be aware of is the subscapularis recess and the subcoracoid bursa. Now, subcoracoid bursa lies superficial to the subscapularis muscle and it does not communicate with the joint. It does not go deep to the subscapularis muscle. Whereas the subscapularis recess, as you can see over here, it will go deep to the subscapularis muscle and it will also communicate with the joint effusion. So this is how you can differentiate between the two. The neurovascular bundles around the shoulder, the two most important ones is the spinoclinoid notch. This is your glenoid. This is the posterior aspect. This is where the spine of the scapula is arising. So this notch is nothing but the spinoclinoid notch and it comprises of the suprascapular nerve. Now, it is important because whenever there is a posterior superior labral tear, a small glenoid cyst or a large glenoid, uh, sorry, a ganglion cyst or a paralabral cyst or a large paralabral cyst, if it extends into the spinoclinoid notch, it can abut or it can compress the suprascapular nerve in this region, which will result into denervation edema. So, this is one important structure that you need to look at closely. And the another thing is your quadrangular space, which comprises of the axillary nerve. Any uh, space occupying lesion in this region will again compress the axillary nerve and result into denervation changes. Now, let us look at the tendons and the bursae on a coronal PD images. So, this is a coracoid process with a short head of biceps tendon. The first structure anteriorly that you see is your subscapularis tendon. This is the subscapularis muscle, the myotendinous junction, and this is the tendon. Now, in this particular image, you can actually pick up small delaminating tears in the subscapularis tendon. 
Now, as you go posteriorly, you can see the biceps tendon, and just next to the biceps tendon is your anterior supraspinatus tendon. Now, this is a common site for something called as rim rent tears, which are small articular sided tears, and it is often missed on a coronal image. So, make sure you correlate this particular region on a sagittal image as well. Now, as you go posteriorly, you can see this is your supraspinatus tendon. So, as I told you, there is a footprint, a critical zone, and a myotendinous junction. And then further, you can see that there is a subacromial bursa in this region. It is not visible unless it is distended with fluid. Then you can see that this is your infraspinatus tendon. And uh, this is your quadrangular space. Infraspinatus tendon, teres minor tendon, and the myotendinous junctions. Again, infraspinatus, teres minor tendons, and the myotendinous junctions. So this is the posterior most section. And now we look at them at the sagittal images. So, supra, infra and the conjoint tendon where the two merge together. This section is what we've seen in the diagrammatic representation. So, this is the multipinnate subscap, supra, infra forming the conjoint and this, this tiny black structure, this is your teres minor tendon and this black structure is your biceps tendon. So, as you go posteriorly, you can see that we will clearly make out the multipinnate appearance of subscap here. So there is one, two, three, four. So there are multiple tendons in this region. And further posteriorly here, you need to look at your muscle bulk or the muscle volume. And you need to look for muscle fatty infiltration in this region. So we've discussed this anatomy already. And now on the axial images. So supra is not well evaluated on a axial image. Uh, when you go downwards, you begin to see the subscapularis tendon, which is arising from the lesser tuberosity. This is your biceps tendon here, and this is your sub subscapularis myotendinous junction. Similarly, posteriorly, you'll see your infraspinatus tendon, infraspinatus myotendinous junction. Again, over here, you can appreciate the spinoclinoid notch. Then you have the teres minor tendon, which is the lowermost one. This is your teres minor tendon. Teres minor is not much important because it it is it usually does not tear. So that is the least important of amongst all the rotator cuff tendons. And the last thing that we're going to discuss in short is your AC joint or the acromioclavicular joint, which is between the acromion process and the distal end of clavicle. It is stabilized by the superior and inferior acromioclavicular ligaments, and you have a coracoclavicular ligament between the coracoid process and the clavicle. So your AC ligaments or the acromioclavicular ligaments are better seen on coronal images. So you can see they run along the capsule. And here also you can see, so this is your uh, clavicle, this is your acromion process and this thickening is your inferior and this thickening is your superior acromioclavicular ligament. Similarly, your coracoclavicular ligament, you can see that this triatid structure is your coracoclavicular ligament on a coronal image, but it is better evaluated on a sagittal image where you can see this is the coracoid process, the clavicle and then these are your coracoclavicular ligaments here. So, to sum up, always have an approach to read any scan. Make your own approach, be comfortable with whatever you are doing. And this is the checklist to look at the structures in different planes, the important structures which are practically important. So, you in coronal from anterior to posterior, you need to go through these structures. Sagittal from lateral to medial, make sure you look at these structures. And axial, make sure you look at these structures from cranial to cord. And whenever in doubt, please make sure that though one particular structure is seen better on one plane, correlate it on other planes so that you are 100% sure of your diagnosis. Thank you.